Well, we're back together and we're going to continue this look at the book of Jude, the second to last book in the Bible, a really short book that has some compelling application to our lives today. Verse 3 gives us the call of the book, I believe, for each of us even today. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. We're called today, just as the church was called when Jude wrote this letter, to contend for the faith. We started looking at the end of this, this book and, and, and how Jude describes to contend for the faith. Dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you in the last times there will be scoffers who follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up, in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. The steps that Jude gave the church to build ourselves up in the most holy faith. We have a cornerstone that's Jesus Christ that we build our lives on. He said, after we've, we've begun and we continue to build ourselves up, we must pray in the Holy Spirit. We pray in the Spirit. We live in the Spirit. We are a Spirit-led people. Last week, we looked at the reality. He says, keep yourselves in God's love. In this world, there's plenty of things to pull us away from the presence of God, and we must be intentional. We must be active about guarding ourselves and keeping watch so that we remain in the love of God. And this week then, we talk about the engagement piece. This is where we engage the enemy. This is where we engage uh, the opposition. And I get it that some people who write commentary say that, that Jude's statements that, that we'll talk about today, they only apply to, to the body of Christ. I believe there's an application even to the enemy, the ones who were contending against those false prophets who've come out. Uh, and why do I say that? Because if we look in verses 22 through 23, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. It almost seems in these verses, now the engagement step that Jude gives us is that we are to be merciful. We're supposed to be merciful and be a merciful people. And he, he does this and he almost does it in like three steps. We're supposed to be merciful or show mercy to those who doubt, those who maybe have heard and they've started to question. We're to be the vessels of mercy in their life. And then he says, save others by, by snatching them from the fire. I view these as the people who, who are close to stepping over the edge and they just need someone to reach out and actively grab a hold of them and pull them back from the fire. In the third group, he says, to others show mercy mixed with fear hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. This seems as though these are the, the ones who have gone so far. They're distorted and they're, they're distracted by the falsehoods of this world. And when we engage them and show them mercy, we must go with, with fear, with caution, but we are still to show them mercy because it's God's will that none would perish, but that all would have everlasting life. You know, what is mercy? If you had to stop for yourself and define that word, I think it's a word we use a lot of times in church. It's a word that, that, that we toss around here and there, but, but I don't know that we always know what that word means. I want to look at some examples, some descriptions, even on the name of God. God is, is this is a characteristic of God. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter four, but if you seek the Lord, your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you're in distress and all these things have happened to you, then in the later days you'll return to the Lord, your God, and obey him. For the Lord, your God, is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. Deuteronomy 4, it's, it's, a, it's a word to the Israelites. And, and this word is at a compelling time because they're being told that there's a time coming when they're going to disobey God. They're going to turn their backs on him. But the encouragement is that God is a merciful God. 
What does that mean? That, that in those days of distress, when you return to the Lord, that when you come back, that God will be faithful. When you decide that you've disobeyed him long enough, he will be there. He won't abandon you. He won't destroy you, but, but he will maintain the covenant that he made with your fathers, with your ancestors. He's a merciful God. You know, in the Interpreter's Dictionary, it says that mercy is the consideration for a fellow man manifested at times in, in aids of act or relief. It's compassion. Another Bible dictionary I read said it was treating with leniency. It's the endeavor to reclaim. In my eyes, mercy is, is compassion beyond obligation. Mercy is, is the expression or the what causes God's forgiveness to be revealed in our lives. Mercy is being destined for a punishment but set free because of what God has done. You know, when I was a kid, we used to play a game and it was mercy. And whether it was me and my brothers or, or me and another person, we would lock hands and we would twist each other's hands, squeeze and, 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 and move around, maneuver until someone was in pain. Someone had the upper hand. Someone could continue to cause them pain. But as soon as they said the word mercy, the aggression stopped. First John says, if, if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just, and, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Forgiveness is the expression of God's mercy in our lives. A couple examples from the Old Testament. The story of Joseph. Remember Joseph, he had the dreams and he was a dreamer. The coat that his dad gave him, his brothers were jealous. They despised him. They almost killed him and they sold him into slavery. They betrayed him. He goes to Egypt and he rises to promise. We have Potiphar, he falls down, he interprets dreams. He's, he's back, he's, he's the king's right-hand man and then he has a dream or he has an understanding that famine is coming and he prepares Egypt for the famine that's coming. You fast forward, his brothers are, are, are now starving. Their, his father sends his brothers to Egypt to get some food so they can survive the famine. We see this interaction with Joseph and his brothers where they don't recognize Joseph, but they have to come to him and ask him for the goods. And, and Joseph has the upper hand. There's this whole silver cup thing where that, that he actually uh, planted and, and, and revealed that his brother had stolen it. And if he was stolen, then there was a punishment that came. But mercy was revealed in Joseph's actions. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I'm your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land. For the next five years, there'll be no plowing or reaping, but God has sent me ahead of you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Joseph had the fate of his brother's in the palm of his hand. And his choice was to be a merciful servant. He showed them mercy despite everything they had done and everything he could have done. There's another story that I think is compelling when it comes to mercy. It's the story of Saul and David. And remember, David was, was an assistant to Saul and, and Saul loved David. And then Saul kind of goes crazy. And like for seven years, he tries to kill David. He pursues David. He tries to find David. There's one episode that we can read about in, in 1 Samuel chapter 24. Uh, he said to Saul, why do you listen to what men say? David is bent on harming you. This day you've seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he's the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I've not wronged you, but you're hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between me and you and may the Lord avenge the wrong you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. What happened was Saul was pursuing David. He went into a cave to relieve himself. And while he was going to the bathroom, David could have killed him. 
But he went in and cut off a piece of his cloak. And he was so overwhelmed that he even touched his cloak that he fell prostrate before Saul. Even though Saul was trying to kill him and repented and said, I'm sorry. See, he showed him mercy. He, he didn't punish him even though Saul deserved a punishment. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even clothing stained by corrupted flesh. God's mercy is revealed to us through Jesus Christ. Last week, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. We've all been, been sinners. We've all had failure in our life. The punishment for that sin is death. That's the, the punishment, the guilt from sin should be death. But because of the mercy of God revealed through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We're no longer destined to die. Through mercy and loving kindness, the penalty has been paid. We show mercy because we've experienced mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven others. Mercy is the expression of God's forgiveness. When it comes to the way we deal with others, those three tears, people who doubt, we need to show them mercy. People, people who are, are close to jumping over the edge, show them mercy. People who have fallen off the edge, show them the mercy of God. Be clear. Mercy does not mean acceptance. Mercy is allowing the truth of God to be the truth. There is no mercy apart from the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. There is no forgiveness apart from repentance for sin. We still have to acknowledge sin, but God's mercy is going to them saying, God still loves you. Remember the Israelites who disobeyed God? God would not leave them. He would not abandon them. God has not abandoned you. He still loves you. The cross is still applicable in your life. Allow the promise of the cross to be redeemed. That's how we contend for the faith. The Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, may he turn his face toward you, grant you his peace, and may you be merciful just as you've experienced the mercy of God. Be blessed.